Sci-Fi is a Universal Studios network. And now an exclusive Sci-Fi production in search of the prisoner. Move over, Rover. Sci-Fi is taking over. are you on? That would be telling. We want information. Information. Information! <laughs> I am the new number six. <laughs> I am trapped in the most influential cult television series of all time. I am the prisoner. It's just a, a unique television, absolutely unique television experience. It's kind of akin to me to psychedelic music, you know, it's just a very psychedelic kind of trippy thing. It was like what every kid wants to get up and do. He was making a legend, a fable, a myth, an allegory. The Prisoner first aired in 1967 and was the product of one man's eccentric vision. That man was Patrick McGowan. After enjoying huge success in the international smash Danger Man and being offered the role of 007, Patrick was hot property. He approached the then controller of ATV, Lou Grade, with the incredible, almost ridiculous idea of making a program centered on what would happen should Secret Service agents retire or fall foul of the powers that be. I suppose you're wondering what you're doing here. It had crossed my mind. There was to be no discernible plot line and no clear beginning or end to the story. Each week would focus on the hero's attempts to escape from the repressive regime of the village. You not just realised there's no way out. Number six's refusal to accept his fate and the exploration of issues of personal freedom and mind control were the prisoner's driving force. I am not a number, I am a free man. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed or numbered. My life is my own. In essence, the prisoner was the first and arguably the last concept television show. Oh, that's excellent. How did you get interested in The Prisoner? Well, it goes back to a TV series in the early 60s called Danger Man. This starred Patrick McGowan. So the script editor on it, a chap called George Markstein, who had worked for MI5 and the intelligence agencies, he knew of a place in Scotland called Inverlair Lodge, where they used to send spies who knew too much. How did you set up your Prisoner 6 to 1 society? I used to watch it and find that there was a TV announcer that before each episode said, and this week we've got people writing in saying what their theory is. I said, well, I really want to talk to these people. They said, well, you better write to us then. So I wrote to them, but they came back and said, would you like your name and address broadcast at the end of the last episode? I said, oh, I was thrilled, but I didn't know what was going to happen. Within two weeks, I had 600 letters come through and I was beginning to wonder what on earth to do. Weren't you scared by the people who turned up? <laughs> Baby, what a crazy scene! <laughs> no, I wasn't, because, do you know, they all seemed to be quite normal people. Collarbone's connected to the neck bone, and the neck bone's connected to the head bone. Now, hear that word Number of the Lord. There were, presumably, some quite scary prisoner aficionados. <laughs> Many artists have been inspired to produce work influenced by the prisoner and the village of Port Marion. We are young, we run green, keep our tea, nice and clean, see our friends. The 
combination of the powerful visual imagery of the village and the associations with the incredible show have offered artists a ready-made frame of reference for their music and pop promos. My grandfather really was inspired by the idea that one could develop and build one's own private village on some unspoilt shore without defiling the natural landscape. Um, he wanted to practice what he preached as a conservationist and a campaigner for the sustainable use of the countryside. I think that Clough's vision for the village um, and McGoon's vision for his series very much sort of combined to create the prisoner. McGowan needed the village really to place his, his dream or vision for the series and Clough was delighted when he saw the results in that it showed off the village to its best advantage from the air, from all, all angles, in sort of full colour. <laughs> One of its strokes of genius, of course, is that it, it alluringly refuses to, to, to tell you quite what it's about, whose side anyone is on. You don't know. It was shot, of course, and made during, during the Cold War, and so uh, the suggestion is that there are sides, but he never knows and we never know. We just don't quite know. I'm not sure which side runs this village. A mutual problem. No one understood exactly what was going on. I mean, you had Patrick McGowan wandering around this strange village looking at the camera, very resolute, very morose looking. And you'd be sitting, well, what is he, what is going on here? The reason that the prisoner uh, grabbed me as a kid uh, was, oh, I don't know, it was just very strange. Uh, why, 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 I liked it because as a kid, uh, I was very strange. At the time, I, uh, I suppose I didn't understand some of the, um, some of the more sort of adult themes that were going through it. I would have been nine years old. There's something fascinating and sort of all-encompassing about it, you know. When do you plan to escape? How do you know I was going to? It's that British eccentric. It's dated in a really good way. I think, you know, it's dated in a kind of vintage way. That's what number two used to say. I think a, a kid watching it today would, would probably get an, an insight into late 1960s surrealism. And would, would probably be, be fascinated by, by kind of, you know, what, what is it all about? What is all the commotion about? Why, you know, what... Why is it so interesting that they find out why this man jacks in his job? Subject shows great enthusiasm for his work. He is utterly devoted and loyal. Is this a man that suddenly walks out? And I didn't walk out. I resigned. People change, exactly. I think when they made the show back in the 60s, they've obviously had a carte blanche to do what, exactly what they like. So you've got um, all these ideas, you've got references to, to literature, you've got drug references. They're obviously having a great time making it. <laughs> Just remember, no over excitement, please. Mm -hmm. That part of me that makes me um, makes me want to be an actor and uh, an English actor at that who who likes putting on gowns and swaggering as a um, you know prosecuting counsel and things like that. Of course, also wanted to be number two because that's the grand guignol part. That's the part that the wonderfully textured, um, fruity voiced English actors play. Ah, uh, excellent number 12, of course. The Laughing Prisoner, which, uh, which was done um, as, as part of the tube, came about because Jules Holland, uh, he was, you know, taken off. He was just not allowed to be on television, just for saying, just for saying the word. I mean, the F word. And uh, he, uh, so th they had this idea, Jeff Wanfer, who was the director of, uh, of the tube, and Malcolm Gary, who was the producer, that um, when he came back, we should pretend that actually he'd been sent by Channel 4 to, to, to the village. Q, number seven. Yes, you, number seven, up here. Oh, I'm not a number. I'm a television personality. <laughs> <laughs>
We shot a tube special in Port Marion, where the, the village is, as you know. And, uh, and I played the, the number two who had been keeping him prisoner, trying to find out why he'd said this word. I am number two, and this is the village. Get to know it well, number seven. From now on, it's your home. It's your home until you give us certain information that we require from you. Well, I'm perfectly happy to tell you anything you would like to know. What would you like to know? Don't play games with me, number seven. I'm not very good at them. By hook or by crook, by fair means or foul, we will find out why you resign. Well, it's perfectly simple. For a long I begin time, to it? weary of your impertinent tricks, number seven. When I first saw it, I'd just come out of prison, <laughs> amusingly. And I'd thought it was about people inside a prison, so I thought, oh, I'll watch this. And, uh, you know, just that transporting moment of watching me, the first title sequence, and the, uh, and the Lotus. And, uh, and I was there, I was absolutely there. <laughs> I wanted to be a prisoner. Go figure, as they say, across the water. Everything is becoming more clear. I may have found a way out. Is that just what they want me to think? One of the most controversial episodes, Living in Harmony, was co-written by Ian Rakoff. What was it like working with Patrick? Well, it, it was like I was given the freedom to try and portray my interpretation, and then finally it all comes out in brainwashing. You know, that's what it was all about. Six! 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 You don't have to be in entertainment just for entertainment. You can display a certain social conscience, a certain moral concern, and this is what I think motivated Pat McGowan. And this is part of the strength of the series, was that this man was driven to reflect upon the nature of society as we were all falling victim to then and still are now. How relevant do you think the show is today? I don't see why it couldn't have an even greater impact upon many people than it did before. Because our lives have progressively become more frustrating. The telephone is a nightmare when you have an emergency situation and you need to speak to somebody, you get a machine. And then you've got to press a button and you get another machine. And if you speak to a human voice, you are extremely fortunate. I will immobilize all electronic controls. Listen to me. You are free to go. You are free to go. Free to go. Free to go. Free to go. Starring alongside Patrick in Living in Harmony and the final episode, Fallout, was Alexis Canner. Doing The Prisoner had an effect on me in the way that one is affected by working with a big talent. Uh, Peter Brook changed my life when I, when I worked for him, and working for McGowan probably changed my life. All these are influences uh, that we have on each other, and, and, and they're lasting. Oh, Dad, I'm your baby, Dad. Yo, oh, your baby something, Daddy? Confess! The bones is yours, Dad! They came from you, my Daddy. Patrick loves people who have edge, and he sometimes puts people on edge deliberately, which is a perfectly healthy thing to do. When I was uh, preparing for Living in Harmony, the Western, he sent a message to me, which was dutifully handed to me, typed out, and it said, I am taking quick draw lessons from Sammy Davis Jr. and Steve McQueen, period, Patrick. But he wouldn't be able to fake that. So when the day came and we were on the set of Living in Harmony, the Western Village, much money was wagered by the crew and the stuntmen quietly on the sides about who would be the fastest on the draw. Though we both fired, we were so close that only one shot was heard. And we all had to wait for the film to come back from the laboratory the next day to see actually how many little pictures it took for me to get my gun out and him to get his gun out. 
Do you know, there was nothing ever written down between Patrick and Lou. It was all a handshake. And Fallout, pound for pound, even today, is still probably the most expensive 54 minutes of television ever made. That's saying a lot, talking about love and attention. You went on to work with Patrick in 1981. Was this reminiscent of The Prisoner? Kings and Desperate Men was reminiscent of The Prisoner for both me and Patrick because he was a prisoner again and I was the prison keeper. That is one reason, sir, that I am not afraid of you because I have been there before. This relationship of The Prisoner, and uh, which he was playing again, and me, it was difficult for him not to want to swing back into that other ex-secret agent rebellious state of mind. And occasionally he would say to me, come on, Alexis, no one's going to believe that I'm putting up with this stuff. The audience is going to expect me to whip out a credit card and just cut somebody's throat any second now. Number six is terrorized throughout the series by a large ominous balloon called Rover. Rover was built by the prop people. It came out of the water to move along the seashore on wheels. And unfortunately, on the day came for it to do that, it didn't do it. Bernie was the producer production manager. He kept looking at his watch and looking up at the sky and he saw this very peculiar behavior by this white balloon looking object. Patrick took one look at it and said, that's it, that's Rover. Number six is dead. What? Rover got him. I look back on the making of The Prisoner and the honor of having participated in and working with such a tremendously talented giant of a man is one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. I wish most things fell into that category. The pen is mightier than the sword. I think Pat McGoon suffered certainly in the way that any artist who really does expose himself to such a degree, I mean, it was like, this is what I think and feel, and I'm going to have to tell all. I mean, there were things he didn't want to touch upon, personal things, but as far as the morality of government goes in our society, he did tell all, he said it. And that's what I find so admirable. If you get it, what will you do? Less work? I think McGowan's always thought of himself as an actor rather than um, a Hollywood star, which is perhaps why he turned down James Bond, because it was too commercial for him. He just didn't want to be in a business which he saw as um, shallow, with shallow values. I take it you checked my file regarding hostility. Your files are no concern of ours. Patrick's been involved with um, projects which seem to be similar in nature to The Prisoner. He tends to go for Men in Isolation, who's in Escape from Alcatraz, where number six became number two in that he played a prison warden. Um, and he has lines like, no one must see the prisoner. And uh, it just tends to show that he's still in line with all the themes in the prisoner and still maybe a little bit obsessed by it all. That's me. I think Patrick hasn't given many interviews over the years because he tends to be a bit wary of the, the cult side of fandom. He always told actors in the original series that he would hate to think that fans were um, putting pictures of him on their walls. That, that freaked him out a little bit. Um, which is in line with him being an actor rather than a star. I have nothing to say. Is that clear? Patrick's discussed the idea of a remake, but he's always preferred an extension of the concept. He's always talked about writing, producing and directing an extension of The Prisoner, taking it on beyond number six, escaping the village. But uh, he's never discussed actually remaking it himself. Who do you represent? Who elected you? To what place or country do you owe allegiance? The contemporary appeal of The Prisoner is not in question as currently Universal Studios are in development with a big screen production. Some of Hollywood's biggest players are fighting over the coveted role of number six and many acting greats are penciled to fill the globe chair of sinister number two. There has often been talk of a film version of The Prisoner and um, part of one thinks 
uh, you know, never go back. It, it, it's perfect as it is, just the number of episodes um, right up to that extraordinary final episode. It's, it's just as it should be. My favourite scene, I think, from The Prisoner is something to do with, it's to do with quartets. It's to do with gangs. Uh, I think the scene where they're escaping from the village it's, and it's this motley crew of people. I mean, uh, the four of them are probably the oddest gang since Pinky's gang in, in Brighton Rock. Uh, so I think that's my favorite scene with it, throwing things out of that lion's cage, which is traveling down the, uh, down the motorway to London. When he uh, changes himself back to being right-handed, by grabbing the lampstand and deliberately giving himself an electric shock. The way he looks, the way he walks, everything is about him is it's just cool. My favourite moment in it is at the end of Arrival. He, he walks along in front of number six's door, clicks his fingers, and the door opens. He just sort of spins around and in he goes. The Prisoner has influenced a whole genre of risk-taking surreal programming. For example, Twin Peaks, The X-Files and The Outer Limits. Enigmatic number one never appears in the program, but for fans and new viewers alike, this dubious position is securely held by Patrick McGowan. Immerse yourself in number six's world of psychological confusion, paranoia and psychedelia. Be seeing you. 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 And Sci-Fi will be showing more of those interviews at a later date. And you can check out the six of one website, but keep it Sci-Fi now for the series premiere of The Prisoner. Sci-Fi series premiere of The Prisoner begins next on Sci-Fi.